In spirituality, non-dualism, also called non-duality, means not two or one undivided without a second. Nondualism primarily refers to a mature state of consciousness, in which the dichotomy of I other is transcended, and awareness is described as centerless and without dichotomies. Although this state of consciousness may seem to appear spontaneous, it usually follows prolonged preparation through ascetic or meditative, contemplative practice, which includes ethical injunctions. While the term nondualism is derived from Advaita Vedanta. Descriptions of nondual consciousness can be found within Hinduism, Turiya, Sahaja, Buddhism, Buddha nature, Rigpa, Shentong, and Western Christian and Neo-Platonic traditions, Henosis, mystical union. The Asian idea of nondualism developed in the Vedic and post-Vedic Hindu philosophies, as well as in the Buddhist traditions. The oldest traces of nondualism in Indian thought are found as Advaita in the earlier Hindu Upanishads such as Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, as well as other pre-Buddhist Upanishads such as the Chandogya Upanishad, which emphasizes the unity of individual soul called Atman and the Supreme called Brahman. In Hinduism, nondualism has more commonly become associated with the Advaita Vedanta tradition of Adi Shankara. The Buddhist tradition added the teachings of sunyata, the two truths doctrine, the non-duality of the absolute and the relative truth, and the Yogacara notion of mind, thought only, sita matra or representation only, vijñapti matra. Vijñapti Matra and the Two Truths Doctrine, coupled with the concept of Buddha nature, have also been influential concepts in the subsequent development of Mahayana Buddhism, not only in India, but also in China and Tibet, most notably the Chan Zen and Dzogchen traditions. Western Neo-Platonism is an essential element of both Christian contemplation and mysticism, and of Western esotericism and modern spirituality, especially Unitarianism, Transcendentalism, Universalism and Perennialism. Etymology Advaita of Hinduism and Advaya of Buddhism both refer to nondualism. Advaita Advaita is from Sanskrit roots a, not, dvaita, dual, and is usually translated as nondualism, nonduality, and nondual. The term nondualism and the term Advaita, from which it originates, are polyvalent terms. The English word's origin is the Latin duo meaning to, prefixed with non, meaning not. Advaya. Advaya is also a Sanskrit word that means identity, unique, not two, without a second, and typically refers to the two truths doctrine of Mahayana Buddhism, especially Madhyamaka. One of the earliest uses of the word Advaita is found in verse 4.3.32 of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad tilde 800 BCE, and in verses 7 and 12 of the Mandukya Upanishad variously dated to have been composed between 500 BCE to 200 CE. The term appears in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad in the section with a discourse of the oneness of Atman and Brahman, as follows an ocean is that one seer, without any duality Advaita, this is the Brahma world, O king. Thus did Yajnavalka teach him. This is his highest goal, this is his highest success, this is his highest world, this is his highest bliss. All other creatures live on a small portion of that bliss. The English term, Nandal, was also informed by early translations of the Upanishads in Western languages other than English from 1775. These terms have entered the English language from literal English renderings of Advaita, subsequent to the first wave of English translations of the Upanishads. These translations commenced with the work of Muller 1823 in the Monumental Sacred Books of the East 1879. Max Muller rendered Advaita as monism, as have many recent scholars. However, some scholars state that Advaita is not really monism. Topic. Definitions Nondualism is a fuzzy concept, for which many definitions can be found, according to Eastman and Nikoloff. Nondualism is the thought in some Hindu, Buddhist and Taoist schools, which teaches that the multiplicity of the universe is reducible to one essential reality. According to Jeff Foster, Nonduality 
points to the essential oneness wholeness, completeness, unity of life, a wholeness which exists here and now, prior to any apparent separation. Despite the compelling appearance of separation and diversity there is only one universal essence, one reality. Oneness is all there is, and we are included. Jeff Foster further explains, what you are is simply this open space of awareness consciousness, awakeness, being in which absolutely everything seems to come and go, and that space is already at rest, it's already home. David Loy, who sees non-duality between subject and object as a common thread in Taoism, Mahayana Buddhism, and Advaita Vedanta, distinguishes five flavors of non-duality. The negation of dualistic thinking in pairs of opposites. The yin-yang symbol of Taoism symbolizes the transcendence of this dualistic way of thinking. Monism, the non-plurality of the world. Although the phenomenal world appears as a plurality of things, in reality they are of a single cloth. Advaita, the non-difference of subject and object, or non-duality between subject and object. Advaya, the identity of phenomena and the absolute, the non-duality of duality and non-duality. C. Q. The non-duality of relative and ultimate truth is found in Madhyamaka and the Two Truths doctrine. Mysticism, a mystical unity between God and man. The idea of non-dualism is typically contrasted with dualism, with dualism defined as the view that the universe and the nature of existence consists of two realities, such as the God and the world, or as God and devil, or as mind and matter, and so on. The idea of a non-dual consciousness has gained attraction and popularity in Western spirituality and New Age thinking. It is recognized in the Asian traditions, but also in Western and Mediterranean religious traditions, and in Western philosophy. Nandal consciousness is perceived in a wide variety of religious traditions. Hinduism Upanishad The Advaita Vedanta of Shankara Tantra and Kashmira Shaivism Ramana Maharshi Buddhism Shunyavada or the Madhyamika school. Vijnanavada or the Yogacara school. Tathagatagarbha thought. Vajrayana Buddhism. Zen Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism, including Dzogchen and Mahamudra. Sikhism. Taoism. Subhid. Abrahamic traditions. Sufism. Western philosophy. Neo Platonism. Hinduism Advaita refers to non-dualism, non-distinction between realities, the oneness of Atman and Brahman, as in Vedanta, Shaktism and Shaivism. Although the term is best known from the Advaita Vedanta school of Adi Shankara, Advaita is used in treatises by numerous medieval era Indian scholars, as well as modern schools and teachers. The Hindu concept of Advaita refers to the idea that all of the universe is one essential reality, and that all facets and aspects of the universe is ultimately an expression or appearance of that one reality. According to Dasgupta and Mohanta, non dualism developed in various strands of Indian thought, both Vedic and Buddhist, from the Upanishadic period onward. The oldest traces of non-dualism in Indian thought may be found in the Chandogya Upanishad, which predates the earliest Buddhism. Pre-sectarian Buddhism may also have been responding to the teachings of the Chandogya Upanishad, rejecting some of its Atman Brahman related metaphysics. Advaita appears in different shades in various schools of Hinduism, such as in Advaita Vedanta, Vishishtadvaita Vedanta, Vaishnavism, Suddhadvaita Vedanta, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, and Shaktism. It implies, in Advaita Vedanta of Adi Shankara, that all of the reality is Brahman, and that the Atman soul, self, and Brahman ultimate unchanging reality are one. Advaita ideas of schools within Hinduism contrasts with its Dvaita schools such as of Madhvacharya who stated that the experienced reality and God are two dual and distinct. Vedanta <inaudible> <inaudible> Several schools of Vedanta teach a form of non-dualism. The best known is Advaita Vedanta, but other Nandal Vedanta schools also have a significant influence and following, such as Vishishtadvaita Vedanta and Shuddhadvaita, both of which are Topic: Beta Advaita Vedanta 
The non-duality of the Advaita Vedantins is of the identity of Brahman and the Atman. Advaita has become a broad current in Indian culture and religions, influencing subsequent traditions like Kashmir Shaivism. The oldest surviving manuscript on Advaita Vedanta is by Gaudapada 6th century CE, who has traditionally been regarded as the teacher of Govinda Bhagavatpada and the grand teacher of Shankara. Advaita is best known from the Advaita Vedanta tradition of Adi Shankara, who states that Brahman is pure being, consciousness and bliss Sat -cit ananda. .Advaita, states Murti, is the knowledge of Brahman and self-consciousness without differences. The goal of Vedanta is to know the truly real and thus become one with it. According to Advaita Vedanta, Brahman is the highest reality, the universe, according to Advaita philosophy, does not simply come from Brahman, it is Brahman. Brahman is the single binding unity behind the diversity in all that exists in the universe. Brahman is also that which is the cause of all changes. Brahman is the creative principle which lies realized in the whole world. The non-dualism of Advaita, relies on the Hindu concept of Atman which is a Sanskrit word that means, real self, of the individual, essence, and soul. Atman is the first principle, the true self of an individual beyond identification with phenomena, the essence of an individual. Atman is the universal principle, one eternal indifferentiated self luminous consciousness, asserts Advaita Vedanta school of Hinduism. Advaita Vedanta philosophy considers Atman as self existent awareness, limitless, non dual, and same as Brahman. Advaita school asserts that there is soul, self within each living entity which is fully identical with Brahman. This identity holds that there is one soul that connects and exists in all living beings, regardless of their shapes or forms, there is no distinction, no superior, no inferior, no separate devotee soul Atman, no separate God soul Brahman. The oneness unifies all beings, there is the divine in every being, and all existence is a single reality, state the Advaita Vedantins. The nondualism concept of Advaita Vedanta asserts that each soul is non-different from the infinite Brahman. Advaita Vedanta – Three Levels of Reality Advaita Vedanta adopts sublation as the criterion to postulate three levels of ontological reality. Paramarthika – Paramartha, absolute, the reality that is metaphysically true and ontologically accurate. It is the state of experiencing that, which is absolutely real and into which both other reality levels can be resolved. This experience can't be sublated exceeded by any other experience. Vyavaharika Vyavahara, or Samvriti Saya, consisting of the empirical or pragmatic reality. It is ever-changing over time, thus empirically true at a given time and context but not metaphysically true. It is our world of experience, the phenomenal world that we handle every day when we are awake. It is the level in which both jiva living creatures or individual souls and iswara are true, here, the material world is also true. Pratibhasika, Pratibhasika, apparent reality, unreality, reality based on imagination alone. It is the level of experience in which the mind constructs its own reality. A well-known example is the perception of a rope in the dark as being a snake. Similarities and differences with Buddhism Scholars state that Advaita Vedanta was influenced by Mahayana Buddhism, given the common terminology and methodology and some common doctrines. Eliot Deutsch and Rohit Dalvi state, In any event a close relationship between the Mahayana schools and Vedanta did exist, with the latter borrowing some of the dialectical techniques, if not the specific doctrines, of the former. Advaita Vedanta is related to Madhyamaka via Gaudapada, who took over the Buddhist doctrine that ultimate reality is pure consciousness Shankara harmonized Gaudapada's ideas with the Upanishadic texts, and provided an orthodox hermeneutical basis for heterodox Buddhist phenomenology. Gaudapada adopted the Buddhist concept of ultimate reality as pure consciousness The Buddhist term is often used interchangeably with the term sata matra, but they have different meanings. The standard translation of both terms is consciousness only or mind only. Advaita Vedanta has been called idealistic monism by scholars, but some disagree with this label. Another concept found in both Madhyamaka Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta is Ajatavada, 
Ajata, which Gaudapada adopted from Nagarjuna's philosophy. Gaudapada wove both doctrines into a philosophy of the Mandukaya Upanishad, which was further developed by Shankara. Michael Komen states there is a fundamental difference between Buddhist thought and that of Gaudapada, in that Buddhism has as its philosophical basis the doctrine of dependent origination, according to which everything is without an essential nature, and everything is empty of essential nature. While Gaudapada does not rely on this principle at all. Gaudapada's Ajatavada is an outcome of reasoning applied to an unchanging nondual reality according to which there exists a reality sat that is unborn Asia, that has essential nature svabhava, and this is the eternal, fearless, undecaying self Atman and Brahman. Quote dot. Thus, Gaudapada differs from Buddhist scholars such as Nagarjuna, states Komans, by accepting the premises and relying on the fundamental teaching of the Upanishads. Among other things, Vedanta school of Hinduism holds the premise, Atman exists, as self-evident truth, a concept it uses in its theory of nondualism. Buddhism, in contrast, holds the premise, Atman does not exist or, an Atman as self-evident. Mahadevan suggests that Gaudapada adopted Buddhist terminology and adapted its doctrines to his Vedantic goals, much like early Buddhism adopted Upanishadic terminology and adapted its doctrines to Buddhist goals, both used pre-existing concepts and ideas to convey new meanings. Dasgupta and Mohanta note that Buddhism and Shankara's Advaita Vedanta are not opposing systems, but Different phases of development of the same non-dualistic metaphysics from the Upanishadic period to the time of Sankara. Topic: <inaudible> Vishishtadvaita Vedanta. Vishishtadvaita Vedanta is another main school of Vedanta and teaches the non-duality of the qualified whole, in which Brahman alone exists, but is characterized by multiplicity. It can be described as qualified monism, or qualified non-dualism, or attributive monism. According to this school, the world is real, yet underlying all the differences is an all-embracing unity, of which all things are an attribute. Ramanuja, the main proponent of Vishishtadvaita philosophy contends that the prasthana treya, the three courses, Namely the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutras, are to be interpreted in a way that shows this unity in diversity, for any other way would violate their consistency. Vedanta Desika defines Vishishtadvaita using the statement, Asesha chit achit prakaram brahmaikamevatitvam Brahman, as qualified by the sentient and insentient modes or attributes, is the only reality. Neo Vedanta. Neo-Vedanta, also called Neo-Hinduism, is a modern interpretation of Hinduism which developed in response to Western colonialism and Orientalism, and aims to present Hinduism as a homogenized ideal of Hinduism. With Advaita Vedanta as its central doctrine, Neo-Vedanta, as represented by Vivekananda and Radhakrishnan, is indebted to Advaita Vedanta, but also reflects Advaya philosophy. A main influence on Neo-Advaita was Ramakrishna, himself a bhakta and tantrika, and the guru of Vivekananda. According to Michael Taft, Ramakrishna reconciled the dualism of formlessness and form. Ramakrishna regarded the supreme being to be both personal and impersonal, active and inactive. When I think of the supreme being as inactive, neither creating nor preserving nor destroying, I call him Brahman or Purusha, the impersonal god. When I think of him as active, creating, preserving and destroying, I call him Sakti or Maya or Prakriti, the personal god. But the distinction between them does not mean a difference. The personal and impersonal are the same thing, like milk and its whiteness, the diamond and its luster, the snake and its wriggling motion. It is impossible to conceive of the one without the other. The Divine Mother and Brahman are one. Radhakrishnan acknowledged the reality and diversity of the world of experience, which he saw as grounded in and supported by the Absolute or Brahman. According to Anil Sukhla, Vivekananda's Neo-Advaita "...reconciles Dvaita or dualism and Advaita or non-dualism." The Neo-Vedanta is also Advaitic inasmuch as it holds that Brahman, the ultimate reality, is one without a second, Ekamavadvidyam. 
but as distinguished from the traditional Advaita of Sankara, it is a synthetic Vedanta which reconciles Dvaita or dualism and Advaita or non-dualism and also other theories of reality. In this sense it may also be called concrete monism insofar as it holds that Brahman is both qualified, saguna, and qualityless, nirguna. Radhakrishnan also reinterpreted Shankara's notion of Maya. According to Radhakrishnan, Maya is not a strict absolute idealism, but a subjective misperception of the world is ultimately real." According to Sarma, standing in the tradition of Nisargadatta Maharaj, Advaitavada means, "...spiritual non-dualism or absolutism," in which opposites are manifestations of the absolute, which itself is immanent and transcendent. All opposites like being and non-being, life and death, good and evil, light and darkness, gods and men, soul and nature are viewed as manifestations of the Absolute which is immanent in the universe and yet transcends it. <laughs> Kashmir Shaivism Advaita is also a central concept in various schools of Shaivism, such as Kashmir Shaivism and Shiva Advaita. Kashmir Shaivism is a school of Savism, described by Abhinavagupta as Paradvaita, meaning the supreme and absolute non-dualism. It is categorized by various scholars as monistic idealism, absolute idealism, theistic monism, realistic idealism, transcendental physicalism, or concrete monism. Kashmir Savism is based on a strong monistic interpretation of the Bhairava Tantras and its subcategory the Kala Tantras, which were tantras written by the Kapalikas. There was additionally a revelation of the Shiva Sutras to Vasugupta. Kashmir Savism claimed to supersede the dualistic Shaiva Siddhanta. Somananda, the first theologian of monistic Savism, was the teacher of Utpaladeva, who was the grand teacher of Abhinavagupta, who in turn was the teacher of Kse Maharaja. The philosophy of Kashmir Shaivism can be seen in contrast to Shankara's Advaita. Advaita Vedanta holds that Brahman is inactive Niskriya and the phenomenal world is an illusion Maya. In Kashmir Shaivism, all things are a manifestation of the universal consciousness, Chit or Brahman. Kashmir Shaivism sees the phenomenal world Sakti as real, it exists, and has its being in consciousness Chit. Kashmir Shaivism was influenced by, and took over doctrines from, several orthodox and heterodox Indian religious and philosophical traditions. These include Vedanta, Samkhya, Patanjali Yoga and Nyayas, and various Buddhist schools, including Yogacara and Madhyamika, but also Tantra and the Nath tradition. Contemporary vernacular Advaita Advaita is also part of other Indian traditions, which are less strongly, or not all, organized in monastic and institutional organizations. Although often called, Advaita Vedanta, these traditions have their origins in vernacular movements and householder traditions, and have close ties to the Nath, Nayanars and San Mat traditions. Ramana Maharshi Ramana Maharshi the 30th of December 1879 to the 14th of April 1950 is widely acknowledged as one of the outstanding Indian gurus of modern times Ramana's teachings are often interpreted as Advaita Vedanta though Ramana Maharshi never received diksha initiation from any recognized authority Ramana himself did not call his insights Advaita D. De Sri Bhagavan Advocate Advaita, M. Dvaita and Advaita are relative terms. They are based on the sense of duality. The self is as it is. There is neither Dvaita nor Advaita. I am that I am. Simple being is the self. <laughs> Neo-Advaita Neo-Advaita is a new religious movement based on a modern, Western interpretation of Advaita Vedanta, especially the teachings of Ramana Maharshi. According to Arthur Verslaus, Neo-Advaita is part of a larger religious current which he calls immediatism. The assertion of immediate spiritual illumination without much if any preparatory practice within a particular religious tradition. Neo-Advaita is criticized for this immediatism and its lack of preparatory practices. Notable Neo-Advaita teachers are H. W. L. Poonja and his students Gangaji, Andrew Cohen, and Eckhart Tolle. Topic: 
Natha Sampradaya and Inchigari Sampradaya The Natha Sampradaya, with Nath yogis such as Goraknath, introduced Sahaja, the concept of a spontaneous spirituality. Sahaja means, "...spontaneous, natural, simple, or easy." According to Ken Wilbur, this state reflects non-duality. <inaudible> Buddhism The Advaya concept of non-duality refers to the non two understanding of reality, which has its origins in Madhyamaka thought, which in turn is built on earlier Buddhist thought, and expressed in the Two Truths doctrine. In Nagarjuna's interpretation it is the non-duality of conventional and ultimate truth, or the overcoming of dichotomies such as that between samsara conditioned or relative reality, rebirth and nirvana unconditioned and absolute reality, liberation. Nondualism in Buddhism is explicitly represented by the concept of Buddha nature, and Tibetan concepts like Rigpa and Shentong. It has its roots in Buddhist ideas of luminous mind, the pure. Consciousness which shines through when purified from the defilements of hatred, anger and ignorance. Nondualism can also be found in Yogacara thought, and its concept of the Elijah Vijnana. Subsequently, combinations of Buddha nature thought and Yogacara, and also of Yogacara and Madhyamaka, developed in India, Tibet and China, and can be found in Tibetan Buddhism and Zen. The non-duality of relative and ultimate truth was further developed and reinterpreted in Chinese Buddhism, where the Two Truths doctrine came to refer to the non-duality of nirvana and samsara, reincorporating essentialist notions. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Indian Buddhism. Topic. <inaudible> Madhyamaka, non-duality of conventional and ultimate truth In Madhyamaka Buddhism Advaya refers to the non-duality of conventional and ultimate truth, or the relative phenomenal world and the absolute, such as in samsara and nirvana. Madhyamaka, also known as Sunyavada, refers primarily to a Mahayana Buddhist school of philosophy founded by Nagarjuna. In Madhyamaka, the two truths refer to conventional and ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is emptiness, or non-existence of inherently existing things, and the emptiness of emptiness. Emptiness does not in itself constitute an absolute reality. Conventionally, things exist, but ultimately, they are empty of any existence on their own, as described in Nagarjuna's Mulamadhyamakakarika. The Buddha's teaching of the Dharma is based on two truths, a truth of worldly convention and an ultimate truth. Those who do not understand the distinction drawn between these two truths do not understand the Buddha's profound truth. Without a foundation in the conventional truth the significance of the ultimate cannot be taught. Without understanding the significance of the ultimate, liberation is not achieved. Emptiness is a consequence of pratityasamutpada dependent arising, the teaching that no dharma thing has an existence of its own, but always comes into existence in dependence on other dharmas. According to Madhyamaka all phenomena are empty of substance or essence Sanskrit, svabhava, because they are dependently co-arisen. Likewise it is because they are dependently co-arisen that they have no intrinsic, independent reality of their own. Madhyamaka also rejects the existence of an absolute reality or self. Ultimately, absolute reality is not an absolute, or the non-duality of a personal self and an absolute self, but the deconstruction of such reifications. It also means that there is no transcendental ground, and that ultimate reality has no existence of its own, but is the negation of such a transcendental reality, and the impossibility of any statement on such an ultimately existing transcendental reality, it is no more than a fabrication of the mind. Susan Kahn further explains, Ultimate truth does not point to a transcendent reality, but to the transcendence of deception. It is critical to emphasize that the ultimate truth of emptiness is a negational truth. In looking for inherently existent phenomena it is revealed that it cannot be found. This absence is not findable because it is not an entity, just as a room without an elephant in it does not contain an elephantless substance. Even conventionally, elephantlessness does not exist. Ultimate truth or emptiness does not point to an essence or nature, however subtle, that everything is made of. In Madhyamaka Buddhism, 
Advaya is an epistemological approach. It is the recognition that ultimately everything is impermanent anicca and devoid of self or essence anatta, and that this emptiness does not constitute an absolute reality in itself. The later Madhyamikas, states Yuichi Kajiyama, developed the Advaya definition as a means to nirvikalpa samadhi by suggesting that things arise neither from their own selves nor from other things, and that when subject and object are unreal, the mind, being not different, cannot be true either, thereby one must abandon attachment to cognition of non-duality as well, and understand the lack of intrinsic nature of everything." Thus, the Buddhist non-dualism or Advaya concept became a means to realizing absolute emptiness. Yogacara In Yogacara, Adyeva may also refer to overcoming the dichotomies of cognitum and cognition imposed by conceptual thought. Yogacara Sanskrit, literally, yoga practice, one whose practice is yoga, is an influential school of Buddhist philosophy and psychology emphasizing phenomenology and some argue, ontology through the interior lens of meditative and yogic practices. It developed within Indian Mahayana Buddhism in about the 4th century CE. The concept of Adyava in Yogacara is an epistemological stance on the nature of knowledge. Early Buddhism schools such as Sarvastivada and Satrantika, that thrived through the early centuries of the Common Era, postulated a dualism, dvaya, wherein grasping grahaka, cognition, and the grasped gradya, cognitum, both are really existing. Yogacara postulates an advaya of grasping and the grasped, stating that only the mind or the representations we cognize really exist. In Yogacara thought, cognition is a modification of the base consciousness, alaya vijnana. By the reification of these modifications into separate consciousnesses, the eight consciousnesses of Yogacara came into existence. In later Buddhist thought, which took an idealistic turn, the storehouse consciousness or base consciousness came to be seen as a pure consciousness, from which everything arises. According to the Lankavatara Sutra and the schools of Chan, Zen Buddhism, the Alaya Vijnana is identical with the Tathagata Garbha, and is fundamentally pure. Vijñapti Matra, coupled with Buddha nature or Tathagatagarbha, has been an influential concept in the subsequent development of Mahayana Buddhism, not only in India, but also in China and Tibet, most notable in the Chan Zen and Dzogchen traditions. According to Kachamudam, Yogacara is a realistic pluralism. It does not deny the existence of individual beings, but denies the following 1. That the absolute mode of reality is consciousness, mind, ideas, 2. That the individual beings are transformations or evolutes of an absolute consciousness, mind, idea. 3. That the individual beings are but illusory appearances of a monistic reality. Vijñapti Matra, consciousness only, or representation only, is one of the main features of Yogacara philosophy. It is often used interchangeably with the term Sita Matra, but they have different meanings. The standard translation of both terms is consciousness only or mind only several modern researchers object to this translation and the accompanying label of absolute idealism or idealistic monism a better translation for vijñapti matra is representation only vijñapti matra then means mere representation of consciousness t he phrase vijñaptimatrata vada means a theory which says that the world as it appears to the unenlightened ones is mere representation of consciousness Therefore, any attempt to interpret Vijñaptimatratavada as idealism would be a gross misunderstanding of it. The term Vijñapti Matra replaced the more metaphysical term Sita Matra used in the Lankavatara Sutra. The Lankavatara Sutra appears to be one of the earliest attempts to provide a philosophical justification for the absolutism that emerged in Mahayana in relation to the concept of Buddha. It uses the term sita matra, which means properly, thought only. By using this term it develops an ontology, in contrast to the epistemology of the term vijñapti matra. The Lankavatara Sutra equates sita and the absolute. According to Kachamudam, this is not the way Yogacara uses the term vijñapti. T he absolute state is defined simply as emptiness, namely the emptiness of subject-object distinction. 
Once thus defined as emptiness sunyata, it receives a number of synonyms, none of which betray idealism. The Yogacarans define three basic modes by which we perceive our world. These are referred to in Yogacara as the three natures of perception. They are Parikalpita literally, fully conceptualized, imaginary nature, wherein things are incorrectly comprehended based on conceptual construction, through attachment and erroneous discrimination. Paratantra literally, other dependent, dependent nature, by which the correct understanding of the dependently originated nature of things is understood. Paranispana literally, fully accomplished, absolute nature, through which one comprehends things as they are in themselves, uninfluenced by any conceptualization at all. Also, regarding perception, the Yogacarans emphasized that our everyday understanding of the existence of external objects is problematic, since in order to perceive any object and thus, for all practical purposes, for the object to exist, there must be a sensory organ as well as a correlative type of consciousness to allow the process of cognition to occur. Buddha nature Vijñapti Matra and the Two Truths doctrine, as understood in Chinese Buddhism, are closely linked to Buddha nature. Those teachings have had a profound influence on Mahayana Buddhism, not only in India, but also in China and Tibet, most notably the Chan and Dzogchen traditions. They may be related to an archaic form of Buddhism which is close to Brahmanical beliefs, elements of which are preserved in the Nikayas, and survived in the Mahayana tradition. Contrary to popular opinion, the Theravada and Mahayana traditions may be divergent, but equally reliable records of a pre-canonical Buddhism which is now lost forever." The Mahayana tradition may have preserved a very old, pre-canonical, tradition, which was largely, but not completely, left out of the Theravada canon. The Buddhist teachings on the Buddha nature may be regarded as a form of nondualism. Buddha nature is the essential element that allows sentient beings to become Buddhas. The term, Buddha nature, is a translation of the Sanskrit coinage, Buddha Dhatu, which seems first to have appeared in the Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra, where it refers to a sacred nature that is the basis for beings becoming Buddhas. The term seems to have been used most frequently to translate the Sanskrit, Tathagatagarbha. The Sanskrit term, Tathagatagarbha, may be parsed into Tathagata, the one thus gone, referring to the Buddha, and Garbha, womb. The Tathagatagarbha, when freed from avidya, ignorance, is the Dharmakaya, the Absolute. <laughs> Tantric Buddhism Tantra is a religious tradition that originated in India in the middle of the first millennium CE, and has been practiced by Buddhists, Hindus and Jains throughout South and Southeast Asia. It views humans as a microcosmos which mirrors the macrocosmos. Its aim is to gain access to the energy or enlightened consciousness of the Godhead or Absolute, by embodying this energy or consciousness through rituals. It views the Godhead as both transcendent and immanent, and views the world as real, and not as an illusion. Rather than attempting to see through or transcend the world, the practitioner comes to recognize that the world as I the supreme egoity of the Godhead, in other words, s, he gains a God's eye view of the universe, and recognizes it to be nothing other than herself, himself. For East Asian Buddhist Tantra in particular, this means that the totality of the cosmos is a realm of Dharma, sharing an underlying common principle. Ramakrishna too was a Tantric adherent, although his Tantric background was overlaid and smoothed with an Advaita interpretation by his student Vivekananda. East Asian Buddhism <laughs> Chinese Buddhism, non-duality of mundane and highest reality In Chinese Buddhism the Two Truths doctrine was interpreted as an ontological teaching of three truths, states Weilin Lai, wherein, "...samsaric being and nirvanic emptiness as well any and all distinctions are not two. The Chinese Buddhist scholars posited that there is a third truth above the mundane truth of samsaric being and the highest truth nirvanic emptiness sunyata. In one description, everything is posited to be simultaneously empty, real and neither. 
According to Lai, most scholars of Chinese Buddhism, unlike Nagarjuna, failed to realize that the two truths were epistemic, not ontological. This mistake was identified and discussed by Jizang of Sanlun school. Chinese Buddhism evolved over time. Before 400 CE, states Lai, the Chinese understood the Buddhist doctrine to be that, karmic rebirth entailed the transmigration of soul. It was monk Mindu who understood that the Buddha taught a no-soul doctrine, and he tried to explain this to his Buddhist Sangha, but was vilified for denying the existence of soul. Mindu's ideas, however, began a momentum that led to the emergence of six prajna schools in the 4th and 5th century CE. In the 6th century CE it became clear that anatman and sunyata are central Buddhist teachings, which make the postulation of an eternal self problematic. Another point of confusion was the two truths doctrine of Madhyamaka, the mundane truth and the highest truth. Chinese thinking took this to refer to two ontological truths, reality exists at two levels, the mundane level of samsara and the highest level of nirvana emptiness. But in Madhyamaka these are two epistemological truths, two different ways to look at reality. The early Chinese scholars supposed that there is an essential truth above the two truths, which unites both these. This three truths doctrine was different from a similarly named doctrine of Yogacara and Indian Buddhism. Hua <laughs> Yen Buddhism The Huayan school or flower garland is a tradition of Mahayana Buddhist philosophy that flourished in China during the Tang period particularly with Fazang It is based on the Sanskrit flower garland sutra s. Avatamsaka Sutra, C. Huayan Jing and on a lengthy Chinese interpretation of it, the Huayan Lun, the name flower garland is meant to suggest the crowning glory of profound understanding. Huayan teaches the four dharmadhatu, four ways to view reality. All dharmas are seen as particular separate events. All events are an expression of the Absolute. Events and essence interpenetrate. All events interpenetrate. <laughs> Zen Buddhism The Buddha nature and Yogacara philosophies have had a strong influence on Chan and Zen. The teachings of Zen are expressed by a set of polarities, Buddha nature, sunyata, absolute relative, sudden and gradual enlightenment. The Lankavatara Sutra, a popular sutra in Zen, endorses the Buddha nature and emphasizes purity of mind, which can be attained in gradations. The Diamond Sutra, another popular sutra, emphasizes sunyata, which must be realized totally or not at all. The Prajnaparamita Sutras emphasize the non-duality of form and emptiness, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, as the Heart Sutra says. According to Chinil, Zen points not to mere emptiness, but to suchness or the Dharmadhatu, the idea that the ultimate reality is present in the daily world of relative reality fitted into the Chinese culture which emphasized the mundane world and society. But this does not explain how the Absolute is present in the relative world. This question is answered in such schemata as the five ranks of Tozen and the Oxerding pictures. The continuous pondering of the break through koan shoken or wa tou word head, leads to kensho, an initial insight into seeing the Buddha nature. According to Hori, a central theme of many koans is the identity of opposites and point to the original non-duality. Victor Sojin Hori describes Kensho, when attained through koan study, as the absence of subject-object duality. The aim of the so-called break through koan is to see the non-duality of subject and object in which subject and object are no longer separate and distinct. Zen Buddhist training does not end with Kensho. Practice is to be continued to deepen the insight and to express it in daily life, to fully manifest the non-duality of absolute and relative. To deepen the initial insight of Kensho, Shikantaza and Koan study are necessary. This trajectory of initial insight followed by a gradual deepening and ripening is expressed by Lin Ji Yixuan in his Three Mysterious Gates, The Four Ways of Knowing of Hakuan, The Five Ranks, and The Ten Ox Herding Pictures which detail the steps on the path. Topic. Essence function in Korean Buddhism The polarity of absolute and relative is also expressed as essence function. The absolute is essence, the relative is function. They can't be seen as separate realities, but interpenetrate each other. 
The distinction does not exclude any other frameworks such as Neng so or subject object constructions, though the two are completely different from each other in terms of their way of thinking. In Korean Buddhism, essence function is also expressed as body and the body's functions. A metaphor for essence function is a lamp and its light, a phrase from the Platform Sutra, where essence is lamp and function is light. Topic: <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism. Topic: <laughs> Adyava Gelugpa School Prasangika Madhyamaka. The Gelugpa school, following Tsongkhapa, adheres to the Adyava Prasangika Madhyamaka view, which states that all phenomena are sunyata, empty of self-nature, and that this emptiness is itself only a qualification, not a concretely existing absolute reality. <laughs> Buddha nature and the nature of mind Shentong In Tibetan Buddhism, the essentialist position is represented by Shentong, while the nominalist, or non-essentialist position, is represented by Rangtong. Shentong is a philosophical sub-school found in Tibetan Buddhism. Its adherents generally hold that the nature of mind, the substratum of the mindstream, is empty. Wiley, Stong of other. Wiley, G. Zan, i.e., empty of all qualities other than an inherently existing, ineffable nature. Shentong has often been incorrectly associated with the Chittimatra position, but is in fact also Madhyamaka, and is present primarily as the main philosophical theory of the Jonang school, although it is also taught by the Sakya and Kagyu schools. According to Shentongpa, proponents of Shentong, the emptiness of ultimate reality should not be characterized in the same way as the emptiness of apparent phenomena because it is Prabhasvara Samtana, or luminous mindstream, endowed with limitless Buddha qualities. It is empty of all that is false, not empty of the limitless Buddha qualities that are its innate nature. The contrasting Prasangika view that all phenomena are sunyata, empty of self-nature, and that this emptiness is not a concretely existing absolute reality, is labeled Rangtong, empty of other. The Shentong view is related to the Ritnagatravabhaga Sutra and the Yogacara Madhyamaka synthesis of Santaraksita. The truth of sunyata is acknowledged, but not considered to be the highest truth, which is the empty nature of mind. Insight into sunyata is preparatory for the recognition of the nature of mind. Zochen. Dzogchen is concerned with the natural state and emphasizes direct experience. The state of nondual awareness is called rigpa. This primordial nature is clear light, unproduced and unchanging, free from all defilements. Through meditation, the Dzogchen practitioner experiences that thoughts have no substance. Mental phenomena arise and fall in the mind, but fundamentally they are empty. The practitioner then considers where the mind itself resides. Through careful examination one realizes that the mind is emptiness, Karma Lingpa 1326 revealed, self-liberation through seeing with naked awareness, Rigpa Go Sprad, which is attributed to Pamamsambhava. The text gives an introduction, or pointing out instruction, Go Spro, into Rigpa, the state of presence and awareness. In this text, Karma Lingpa writes the following regarding the unity of various terms for non-duality, with respect to its having a name, the various names that are applied to it are inconceivable in their numbers, some call it the nature of the mind, or mind itself, some Tirthakas call it by the name Atman or the self, the Sravakas call it the doctrine of Anatman or the absence of a self, the Chittimatrans call it by the name Chitta or the mind, some call it the Prajnaparamita or the perfection of wisdom, some call it the name Tathagata Garbha or the embryo of Buddhahood. Some call it by the name Mahamudra or the great symbol. Some call it by the name the unique sphere. Some call it by the name Dharmadhatu or the dimension of reality. Some call it by the name Alaya or the basis of everything. And some simply call it by the name ordinary awareness. <laughs> 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 
Topic: Other Eastern religions. Apart from Hinduism and Buddhism, self-proclaimed non-dualists have also discerned non-dualism in other religious traditions. Topic: <inaudible> Sikhism. Sikh theology suggests human souls and the monotheistic god are two different realities, dualism, distinguishing it from the monistic and various shades of non-dualistic philosophies of other Indian religions. However, Sikh scholars have attempted to explore non-dualism exegesis of Sikh scriptures, such as during the neocolonial reformist movement by Bhai Veer Singh of the Singh Sabha. According to Mandare, Singh interprets the Sikh scriptures as teaching non-duality. Taoism <inaudible> 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 Taoism's Wu Wei Chinese Wu, not Wei, doing is a term with various translations and interpretations designed to distinguish it from passivity. The concept of yin and yang, often mistakenly conceived of as a symbol of dualism, is actually meant to convey the notion that all apparent opposites are complementary parts of a non-dual whole. <laughs> Western traditions A modern strand of thought sees nondual consciousness as a universal psychological state, which is a common stratum and of the same essence in different spiritual traditions. It is derived from Neo-Vedanta and Neo-Advaita, but has historical roots in Neo-Platonism, Western esotericism, and perennialism. The idea of nondual consciousness as the central essence is a universalistic and perennialist idea, which is part of a modern mutual exchange and synthesis of ideas between Western spiritual and esoteric traditions and Asian religious revival and reform movements. Central elements in the Western traditions are Neo Platonism, which had a strong influence on Christian contemplation, c. q. mysticism, and its accompanying apophatic theology, and Western esotericism, which also incorporated Neo Platonism and Gnostic elements, including Hermeticism. Western traditions are, among others, the idea of a perennial philosophy, Swedenborgianism, Unitarianism, Orientalism, Transcendentalism, Theosophy, and New Age. Eastern movements are the Hindu reform movements such as Vivekananda's Neo Vedanta and Aurobindo's Integral Yoga, the Vipassana movement, and Buddhist modernism. Roman world Gnosticism Since its beginning, Gnosticism has been characterized by many dualisms and dualities, including the doctrine of a separate God and Manichaean good, evil dualism. Ronald Miller interprets the Gospel of Thomas as a teaching of «nondualistic consciousness». <laughs> Neoplatonism The precepts of Neoplatonism of Plotinus 2nd century assert non-dualism. Neoplatonism had a strong influence on Christian mysticism. Some scholars suggest a possible link of more ancient Indian philosophies on Neoplatonism, while other scholars consider these claims as unjustified and extravagant with the counter-hypothesis that non-dualism developed independently in ancient India and Greece. The non-dualism of Advaita Vedanta and Neoplatonism have been compared by various scholars, such as J. F. Stahl, Frederick Copleston, Aldo Magris and Mario Piantelli, Sarvpali Radhakrishnan, Gwen Griffith Dixon, John Y. Fenton and Dale Reap. <laughs> Medieval Abrahamic religions Christian contemplation and mysticism In Christian mysticism, contemplative prayer and apophatic theology are central elements. In contemplative prayer, the mind is focused by constant repetition of phrase or word. Saint John Cassian recommended use of the phrase, O God, make speed to save me, O Lord, make haste to help me. Another formula for repetition is the name of Jesus, or the Jesus prayer, which has been called the mantra of the Orthodox Church. Although the term, Jesus Prayer, is not found in the Fathers of the Church. The author of The Cloud of Unknowing recommended use of a monosyllabic word, such as, 
God or love. Apophatic theology is derived from Neo-Platonism via Pseudo-Dionysus the Areopagite. In this approach, the notion of God is stripped from all positive qualifications, leaving a darkness or unground. It had a strong influence on Western mysticism. A notable example is Meister Eckhart, who also attracted attention from Zen Buddhists like D.T. Suzuki in modern times, due to the similarities between Buddhist thought and Neo-Platonism. The Cloud of Unknowing, an anonymous work of Christian mysticism written in Middle English in the latter half of the 14th century, advocates a mystic relationship with God. The text describes a spiritual union with God through the heart. The author of the text advocates centering prayer, a form of inner silence. According to the text, God can not be known through knowledge or from intellection. It is only by emptying the mind of all created images and thoughts that we can arrive to experience God. Continuing on this line of thought, God is completely unknowable by the mind. God is not known through the intellect but through intense contemplation, motivated by love, and stripped of all thought. Thomism, though not non dual in the ordinary sense, considers the unity of God so absolute that even the duality of subject and predicate, to describe him, can be true only by analogy. In Thomist thought, even the tetragrammaton is only an approximate name, since, I am involves a predicate whose own essence is its subject, the former nun and contemplative Bernadette Roberts is considered a nondualist by Jerry Katz. <laughs> Jewish Hasidism and Kabbalism According to J. Michelson, nonduality begins to appear in the medieval Jewish textual tradition which peaked in Hasidism. According to Michelson, Judaism has within it a strong and very ancient mystical tradition that is deeply non-dualistic. Ein Sof, or infinite nothingness is considered the ground face of all that is. God is considered beyond all proposition or preconception. The physical world is seen as emanating from the nothingness as the many faces partsufim, of God that are all a part of the sacred nothingness. One of the most striking contributions of the Kabbalah, which became a central idea in Chassidic thought, was a highly innovative reading of the monotheistic idea. The belief in one GD is no longer perceived as the mere rejection of other deities or intermediaries, but a denial of any existence outside of GD. <laughs> Neoplatonism in Islam Western esotericism Western esotericism, also called esotericism and esotericism is a scholarly term for a wide range of loosely related ideas and movements which have developed within Western society. They are largely distinct both from Orthodox Judeo-Christian religion and from Enlightenment rationalism. The earliest traditions which later analysis would label as forms of Western esotericism emerged in the Eastern Mediterranean during late antiquity, where Hermetism, Gnosticism, and Neoplatonism developed as schools of thought distinct from what became mainstream Christianity. In Renaissance Europe, interest in many of these older ideas increased, with various intellectuals seeking to combine pagan philosophies with the Kabbalah and with Christian philosophy, resulting in the emergence of esoteric movements like Christian theosophy. Perennial philosophy The perennial philosophy has its roots in the Renaissance interest in Neoplatonism and its idea of the One, from which all existence emanates. Marsilio Ficino sought to integrate Hermeticism with Greek and Jewish Christian thought, discerning a Prisca theologia which could be found in all ages. Giovanni Pico della Mirandola (1463–94) suggested that truth could be found in many, rather than just two, traditions. He proposed a harmony between the thought of Plato and Aristotle, and saw aspects of the Prisca Theologia in Averroes, the Quran, the Kabbalah, and other sources. Agostino Stucco (1497–1548) coined the term Philosophia Perennis. Topic. Orientalism The Western world has been exposed to Indian religions since the late 18th century. The first Western translation of a Sanskrit text was made in 1785. It marked a growing interest in Indian culture and languages. 
The first translation of the dualism and nondualism discussing Upanishads appeared in two parts in 1801 and 1802 and influenced Arthur Schopenhauer, who called them, "...the consolation of my life." Early translations also appeared in other European languages. Transcendentalism and Unitarian Universalism Transcendentalism was an early 19th-century liberal Protestant movement that developed in the 1830s and 1840s in the eastern region of the United States. It was rooted in English and German Romanticism, the biblical criticism of Herder and Schleiermacher, and the skepticism of Hume. The Transcendentalists emphasized an intuitive, experiential approach of religion. Following Schleiermacher, an individual's intuition of truth was taken as the criterion for truth. In the late 18th and early 19th century, the first translations of Hindu texts appeared, which were read by the Transcendentalists and influenced their thinking. The Transcendentalists also endorsed Universalist and Unitarianist ideas, leading to Unitarian Universalism, the idea that there must be truth in other religions as well, since a loving God would redeem all living beings, not just Christians. Among the Transcendentalists' core beliefs was the inherent goodness of both people and nature. Transcendentalists believed that society and its institutions particularly organized religion and political parties ultimately corrupted the purity of the individual. They had faith that people are at their best when truly self-reliant and independent. It is only from such real individuals that true community could be formed. The major figures in the movement were Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, John Muir, Margaret Fuller and Amos Bronson Alcott. <laughs> Neo-Vedanta Unitarian Universalism had a strong impact on Ram Mohan Roy and the Brahmo Samaj, and subsequently on Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda was one of the main representatives of Neo-Vedanta, a modern interpretation of Hinduism in line with Western esoteric traditions, especially Transcendentalism, New Thought and Theosophy. His reinterpretation was, and is, very successful, creating a new understanding and appreciation of Hinduism within and outside India, and was the principal reason for the enthusiastic reception of yoga, transcendental meditation and other forms of Indian spiritual self-improvement in the West. Narendranath Datta Swami Vivekananda became a member of a Freemasonry lodge, at some point before 1884, and of the Sadaran Brahmo Samaj in his twenties, a breakaway faction of the Brahmo Samaj led by Kashab Chandra Sen and Dabendranath Tagore. Ram Mohan Roy (1772–1833), the founder of the Brahmo Samaj, had a strong sympathy for the Unitarians, who were closely connected to the Transcendentalists, who in turn were interested in and influenced by Indian religions early on. It was in this cultic milieu that Narendra became acquainted with Western esotericism. Dabendranath Tagore brought this neo Hinduism closer in line with Western esotericism, a development which was furthered by Keshub Chandra Sen, who was also influenced by transcendentalism, which emphasized personal religious experience over mere reasoning and theology. Sen's influence brought Vivekananda fully into contact with Western esotericism, and it was also via Sen that he met Ramakrishna. Vivekananda's acquaintance with Western esotericism made him very successful in Western esoteric circles, beginning with his speech in 1893 at the Parliament of Religions. Vivekananda adapted traditional Hindu ideas and religiosity to suit the needs and understandings of his Western audiences, who were especially attracted by and familiar with Western esoteric traditions and movements like Transcendentalism and New Thought. In 1897, he founded the Ramakrishna Mission, which was instrumental in the spread of Neo Vedanta in the West, and attracted people like Alan Watts. Aldous Huxley, author of The Perennial Philosophy, was associated with another Neo-Vedanta organization, the Vedanta Society of Southern California, founded and headed by Swami Prabhavananda. Together with Gerald Hurd, Christopher Isherwood, and other followers he was initiated by the Swami and was taught meditation and spiritual practices. Theosophical Society. A major force in the mutual influence of Eastern and Western ideas and religiosity was the Theosophical Society. It searched for ancient wisdom in the East, spreading Eastern religious ideas in the West. One of its salient features was the belief in masters of wisdom. 
beings, human or once human, who have transcended the normal frontiers of knowledge, and who make their wisdom available to others." The Theosophical Society also spread Western ideas in the East, aiding a modernization of Eastern traditions, and contributing to a growing nationalism in the Asian colonies. New Age The New Age movement is a Western spiritual movement that developed in the second half of the 20th century. Its central precepts have been described as "...drawing on both Eastern and Western spiritual and metaphysical traditions and infusing them with influences from self-help and motivational psychology, holistic health, parapsychology, consciousness research and quantum physics." The New Age aims to create a spirituality without borders or confining dogmas that is inclusive and pluralistic. It holds to a holistic worldview, emphasizing that the mind, body and spirit are interrelated and that there is a form of monism and unity throughout the universe. It attempts to create a worldview that includes both science and spirituality and embraces a number of forms of mainstream science as well as other forms of science that are considered fringe. <laughs> <laughs> Scholarly debates <laughs> Nondual consciousness and mystical experience Insight, prajna, kensho, satori, gnosis, theoria, illumination, especially enlightenment or the realization of the illusory nature of the autonomous I or self, is a key element in modern Western nondual thought. It is the personal realization that ultimate reality is nondual, and is thought to be a validating means of knowledge of this nondual reality. This insight is interpreted as a psychological state, and labeled as religious or mystical experience. Topic. Development According to Hori, the notion of «religious experience» can be traced back to William James, who used the term «religious experience» in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. The origins of the use of this term can be dated further back. In the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, several historical figures put forth very influential views that religion and its beliefs can be grounded in experience itself. While Kant held that moral experience justified religious beliefs, John Wesley in addition to stressing individual moral exertion thought that the religious experiences in the Methodist movement paralleling the Romantic movement were foundational to religious commitment as a way of life. Wayne Proudfoot traces the roots of the notion of religious experience to the German theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher (1768-1834), who argued that religion is based on a feeling of the infinite. The notion of religious experience," was used by Schleiermacher and Albert Ritschel to defend religion against the growing scientific and secular critique, and defend the view that human moral and religious experience justifies religious beliefs. Such religious empiricism would be later seen as highly problematic and was, during the period in between world wars, famously rejected by Karl Barth. In the 20th century, religious as well as moral experience as justification for religious beliefs still holds sway. Some influential modern scholars holding this liberal theological view are Charles Raven and the Oxford physicist theologian Charles Coulson. The notion of religious experience was adopted by many scholars of religion, of which William James was the most influential. Topic: <coughs> Criticism. The notion of experience has been criticized. Robert Scharf points out that, "...experience," is a typical Western term, which has found its way into Asian religiosity via Western influences. Insight is not the "...experience," of some transcendental reality, but is a cognitive event, the "...intuitive," understanding or "...grasping," of some specific understanding of reality, as in Kensho or Anubhava. Pure experience does not exist, all experience is mediated by intellectual and cognitive activity. A pure consciousness without concepts, reached by cleaning the doors of perception, would be an overwhelming chaos of sensory input without coherence. Topic: 
Nondual consciousness as common essence Common essence A main modern proponent of perennialism was Aldous Huxley, who was influenced by Vivekananda's Neo-Vedanta and Universalism. This popular approach finds supports in the «common core thesis». According to the «common core thesis», different descriptions can mask quite similar if not identical experiences. According to Elias Amidon there is an «indescribable, but definitely recognizable, reality that is the ground of all being». According to Renard, these are based on an experience or intuition of the real. According to Amidon, this reality is signified by many names from spiritual traditions throughout the world. N. Andal awareness, pure awareness, open awareness, presence awareness, unconditioned mind, rigpa, primordial experience, this, the basic state, the sublime, Buddha nature, original nature, spontaneous presence, the oneness of being, the ground of being, the real, clarity, God consciousness, divine light, the clear light, illumination, realization and enlightenment. According to Renard, nondualism as common essence prefers the term nondualism. Instead of monism, because this understanding is nonconceptual, not graspable in an idea. Even to call this ground of reality, one, or oneness, is attributing a characteristic to that ground of reality. The only thing that can be said is that it is not two, or non-dual. According to Renard, Alan Watts has been one of the main contributors to the popularization of the non-monistic understanding of Nondualism. Topic: Criticism. The common core thesis is criticized by diversity theorists, such as S. T. Katz and W. Proudfoot. They argue that n o unmediated experience is possible, and that in the extreme, language is not simply used to interpret experience, but in fact constitutes experience. The idea of a common essence has been questioned by Yandel, who discerns various religious experiences and their corresponding doctrinal settings, which differ in structure and phenomenological content, and in the evidential value they present. Yandel discerns five sorts Numinous experiences, monotheism, Jewish, Christian, Vedantic, Nirvanic experiences, Buddhism, according to which one sees that the self is but a bundle of fleeting states. Kavala experiences, Jainism, according to which one sees the self as an indestructible subject of experience. Moksha experiences, Hinduism, Brahman, either as a cosmic person, or, quite differently, as qualityless. Nature mystical experience The specific teachings and practices of a specific tradition may determine what experience someone has, which means that this experience is not the proof of the teaching, but a result of the teaching. The notion of what exactly constitutes liberating insight varies between the various traditions, and even within the traditions. Bronkhorst for example notices that the conception of what exactly liberating insight is in Buddhism was developed over time. Whereas originally it may not have been specified, later on the Four Truths served as such, to be superseded by Pratityasamupada, and still later, in the Hinayana schools, by the doctrine of the non-existence of a substantial self or person. And Schmidhausen notices that still other descriptions of this liberating insight exist in the Buddhist canon. See also equals equals notes